Welcome to Wellness Wednesday, everyone. So excited to see some familiar faces and some new faces. Today we have a special guest speaker. Like this, especially when I'm coming to a group where um, you all have you know, familiarity with each other, but I might not be as familiar with you. I like to share just a little bit about my background and let you know like, why I'm even in this position to be with you today. Um, so this is just a little bit of info about me. I live in Northern Virginia. And I always say that I have my day job and my passion job. And my day job is working for the federal government. Um, so I do a lot of different things, but primarily I work in information technology and human capital, uh, which is basically just a fancy way to say that I help recruit and retain and engage um, about 500 or so uh, federal government employees who are all focused on like IT and cybersecurity and stuff like that. Um, so it's a pretty uh, fun job. I actually really enjoy it. One of my main jobs is working on awards and recognition. So I get to express gratitude to my coworkers quite a bit. And I really like that. Um, my passion job on the other end of things is He's on Wheels. Um, and that's why I'm here with you all today. He's on Wheels is actually, um, it's kind of a long story, but I'm gonna make it short for you guys today so that we can get to the good stuff. Um, He's on Wheels is basically like my motivational speaking company where I, travel um, to high schools and colleges mostly, but I do all kinds of groups, especially in quarantine. And these are the three things that I mainly talk about. Disability advocacy, social inclusion, and community engagement. And today's presentation is actually going to be focused more so on these two little nuggets, social inclusion and community engagement. Um, originally, um, obviously, like the disability piece um, is something that I talk about quite a bit but it's um, not like super, super relevant for today's presentation, but I think that you will see that it definitely is going to inform today's presentation um, quite a lot. So a little bit more background on me. Um, I always like to share with people um, one of the most important things about me, and that is the fact that I use a wheelchair to get around. I don't know if you guys can see, but I am seated in a wheelchair, and um, I've been using my wheelchair since the age of three. Um, I was diagnosed with this disease that you see here. Um, it's a neurological disorder called transverse myelitis. And that might sound like a super like complicated science-y word, but it's really not. Transverse means across and myelitis means inflammation. So basically it was an inflammation across the width of my spinal cord. And I was three years old when I was diagnosed with this, but it was not like a super like cut and dry diagnosis. Um, I don't remember much from the day when I became paralyzed, but I do have a lot of stories from like my parents and my siblings and my babysitter. And I was actually at my babysitter's house when I became paralyzed. It was out of nowhere. I literally laid down for a nap. And when I woke up, I couldn't feel my legs. It was that instant. And it was, it was, I mean, it changed my life absolutely forever. And not just my life, but the life of those around me too. Um, I definitely credit my mom and my dad for so much of what they have instilled in me as a person, and not just a person with a disability, but literally as a person, like as a whole. And there were always two things that they really kind of ingrained in my mind as a kid. And the first one was that you can do anything you want. Sometimes you might just have to do it a little bit differently. And that made sense a lot to me as a kid, because you know, when you have a lot of friends who are not like you, who don't definitely don't need a wheelchair or a walker even. Um, it was rare that I even had friends that were like on crutches when I was first paralyzed. You know, it's like, well, yeah, I get it. Like, I can't walk like everyone else. And it was never something that I really like got down on myself about, but I definitely realized that I was different. And the other rule that they always kind of, you know, or value, I should say, that they imposed on me was that you have to make sure that you behave in a way that people see you as an individual before they see your wheelchair. And that did not make any sense to me as a kid. <laughs> I, like, I was like, what do you mean? Like, obviously people are going to see me at the same exact time as they see my wheelchair. Like when they are introduced to me, that's something that's going to be important um, and visible, very visible. Um, but the older that I got, I realized exactly what they meant because a lot of times people would look at me and judge me just because I was sitting on top of four wheels before they even had a conversation with me. And the older I got, the more and more I absolutely couldn't stand that. To this day, I still can't stand it. But especially when I was in college, I'll, I'll always remember, that was where I kind of realized this really big theme in my life, which was that people, especially strangers, 
we're always doing what I call overhelping. And overhelping, the way that I define that is literally like if someone, you know, politely offers you assistance, you know, let's say I'm at the grocery store and they see me looking for something and maybe I look up and they're like, oh, can I reach that jar of ketchup for you, sir? Um, and I'll politely say, no, actually, I just was like thinking about ketchup. I didn't actually want ketchup. But then they like go and get the ketchup and hand it to you anyways. Like that's the definition of overhelping. And that happened all the time in my life, especially as I transitioned, you know, when I was going to college after high school. So because of all of those experiences, which grinded my gears like no other, I decided to create this goal. And this goal that I thought would maybe help me out with this frustration was meeting one new person every single day. And the reason that I decided to make this goal, and I'm like, hear me out here, I know it might sound kind of crazy, but I realized that in like a lot of environments, especially in college, I was always the only one. Like the one person, I was the only, only person using a wheelchair. I was oftentimes the only person who was black. Like I didn't have a ton of classmates and friends who were African American. And I thought that since I was different, that was why people were treating me differently. And I'm, I'm really grateful. Like, let me like kind of stop here and say that I was so grateful that it wasn't in a bad way. Like I was frankly, like not really ever teased or like made fun of when I was in school, which I am like really grateful for. I know that a lot of people cannot say that. Um, and so I really want to honor and have a gratitude for that. But at the same time, like I wanted to be able to live my life independently and not worry about people always over helping me. So that's where I decided to establish this goal of meeting one new person every single day. And the reason I did this was because I wanted to make sure that people were having a positive impact with me. And maybe if they learn like, oh, that Justin guy, like, yeah, he might use a wheelchair to get around, but he doesn't need my help like every second of the day. The more people I could get to think that way, the less people that would overhelp me, you know? So it seemed like pretty like one-to-one, -one, like cut and dry in my mind. Um, but the way that this goal kind of transformed um, especially after I finished college. Like I went to Virginia Tech for my bachelor's for four years and then grad school also at Virginia Tech for two years after that. Um, I realized that like everywhere I went as I started traveling and like seeing more of the world and whether it was a vacation or a conference or just a trip with a friend, I realized that I started like making these connections and having really quality friendships in different parts all over the country and of the world really, but I was experiencing them across the country. And I realized over time that this goal of meeting one new person every day led directly to inclusion. And, you know, there's a difference between diversity and inclusion. That's kind of like a high horse that I'm not going to get on right now, but I will in a little bit. <laughs> um, so get ready for that. But this goal of meeting one new person every day, I realized that it was making other people feel more included also. So not only was it making me feel more involved and included in my social circles and frankly less ostracized, it was also making all of my friends that I was interacting with every single day feel more included. Thereby interacting with me, they were able to interact with other people as well because I was very relentless and am still very relentless about meeting my goal of one new person every day. But fast forward from like college years, like I finished college in 2014, so now it's 2020, and obviously we know one of the biggest things that is taking over the world right now is the coronavirus pandemic. And so if there was anything that has kind of like backfired in my life, I would say it is how much I really, really get my energy from meeting one new person every day. Um, if you've ever like heard about the difference between an introvert and an extrovert, a lot of times people say that the difference is that extroverted people like to go out and hang out with people and that introverted people like to be alone let's like completely correct that right now. It's absolutely like scientifically not true. Um, the fact really is that extroverted people, actually let me explain it this way. Introverted people oftentimes need some more time alone to recharge after being social and being out and doing things. Whereas extroverted people just need less time alone to recharge. And in fact, they might actually get energy from being around external sources or other people. So that's really like the science-y kind of, you know, breakdown behind introvert and extrovert that people often have misconceptions about. So when it came to coronavirus, I was like, oh my gosh, there's this pandemic. Like I literally was afraid to like leave the house at all in like March and like most of April. Um, and I wasn't meeting, I wasn't seeing any of my friends um, other than my roommate and my dog. Uh, but I definitely was falling behind on my goal of meeting one new person every day. Um, I would take my dog outside, you know, around very close around the building that we live in 
but I would always have my mask on. And of course, people weren't very social. You know, you didn't want to linger and hang out with anyone that wasn't part of your pod um, any longer than you really had to. Um, and so as the pandemic took hold, I realized that my life was going to change quite a bit. Um, and so with that, I'm curious, like, what you all kind of experienced. Um, and if you could, like, maybe in the chat, just drop, like, a one word um, emotion that you felt, you know, think back to, like, you know, March and April and May, and I mean, maybe even still now, you know, I know for me, I've been able to kind of, you know, pick myself up a little bit out of the really dark places I was in at the beginning of quarantine, but share with me like some words that describe how you felt, especially as quarantine started. Um, and also, you know, maybe how you feel now. Thank you guys. I see a couple answers already coming in here. Um, yeah, worried, sad, isolated. Shri, good friend, thanks for coming. Shri said overwhelmed, um, powerless. Catherine said chill. Interesting. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask more about that later on. <laughs> um, but yeah, Laura LB echoed someone said powerless. Um, and that's a wonderful Kareen said now she feels more grounded and optimistic. I completely relate to that. Um, yeah, absolutely. And so there was the pandemic um that had us feeling all of these things. But then, you know, fast forward a couple of weeks or maybe a month later, and then we had all of the civil unrest um, and the calls, renewed calls for social justice that were happening across the country um, and across the world. Um, and so like kind of same exercise, if you guys don't mind maybe dropping, um, you know, a couple of words that describe how you felt um, when you started seeing, you know, like after the murder of George Floyd, which happened around Memorial Day, um, and then seeing like the protests and stuff, I'm sure you saw like on the news or, just on social media um yeah grief Jeanette said completely agree um Jada said scared <laughs> yeah um I can tell you like as a black guy like I mean I've never really felt physically threatened um that often in my life but after seeing all of that it was definitely polarizing and worrisome to even literally leave the house um Michaela said that she echoes shock like Eben Eben or Eban said yeah completely agree and um, when I think back to a lot of what I saw about that civil unrest and how things were kind of really just taking over, like it was something that you couldn't escape, you know, it was, it was on the news, it was what your family talked about, it was what your parents talked about, it was what your friends talked about, it was on your social media, like I literally couldn't escape it. And so I started thinking to myself, especially after about a month or two, so I would say like kind of mid-June time frame, I started thinking to myself, okay, like, I definitely, you know, gave space for all of those feelings, like the ones that we just mentioned that you guys described. But then I started thinking to myself, like, how am I gonna keep it together? <laughs> like, how, like, what am I gonna do? What could I possibly change? What are my coping mechanisms going to be so that I can not necessarily move past everything that's going on, but to process it in a more healthy way? That's the kind of question that I started asking myself. And so that's really the question of the day. Um, this is like the question right here that I wanna drive the rest of our conversation today is, how do we keep it together in quarantine times? And quarantine times is a phrase that I use all the time. Um, I really like it. I think it kind of, you know, not that quarantine and the pandemic is not serious, but quarantine times, I think it's just a good portmanteau of the two words instead of having to say quarantine times, because that sounds weird. So quarantine times, it's not a typo. <laughs> um, so, you know, we all miss our friends. We miss each other. We miss that social connection because everything's changed. Like we can't go out. You know, I know for me personally, I love to travel. Um, I go back to Virginia Tech where I went to school all the time, like once every like two or three months. Um, I'm always going, you know, to see friends like Laura, Beth and I, <laughs> our friends, we often have game nights um, and we've had to have those virtually now, which isn't quite the same, but you know, it's, it's, all, it's all just so different from what we're used to. And when you think about it, the science, like if you're having, you know, struggles with this, the science like literally says, yes, it is completely normal and expected to have struggles because this little graphic here, is called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And um, this is one of my favorite sociological theories. I got my, uh, my bachelor's degree, my major in college was sociology. And this is one of the first things I learned about and it's something that I harp on all the time, not just through stuff like this, but like literally in my everyday life. And basically what this pyramid is trying to illustrate is that life is literally, you know, it builds upon each other. Um, so it's saying that, for example, physiological needs, that first section at the very bottom that is highlighted in red, Things like air, food, shelter, and sleep, those are your things that you need literally physically to survive. Those are your physiolog physiological needs. And then what builds upon that are your safety needs, things like security and your health um, and having resources. Resources usually translates to money. 
So once that's taken care of, then you can start to worry about love and belonging in terms of friendship and your family and having a sense of connection with people. And that one right there, the love and belonging is what we are so, you know, kind of what all of us are trying to adapt to is how does friendship and how does intimacy and our connection with other people look when we can't physically see them? Um, like I'll tell you a couple of weekends ago, I literally, I hugged a friend who, you know, I was hanging out. We had like socially distant, distant, distanced for most of that interaction, but it was the end and we were like getting ready to say bye. And I was like, okay, like I've been home, like literally for more than way more than 14 days. I know you have to like, can we just hug each other? And having that hug was like, I will never forget. I don't know if a hug has ever been so wonderful. Um, but all of these quarantines and everything that's going on has really put our concept of our love and belonging factor here um, in the hierarchy of needs at risk. Um, and what this pyramid is also saying is that you cannot have one at, at, that's at the top without having that building block that's below it. So you can't even worry about, for example, your self-esteem if love and belonging isn't there. So if you think like, oh my gosh, like I felt so down and I felt like kind of depressed and upset, you know, through this quarantine situation, that's absolutely to be expected because your esteem is not able to be taken care of if your love and belonging isn't taken care of first. Um, so this graphic, um, I don't want to harp on it too much. I don't want to get like too science on you guys, but um, this is absolutely one of my favorite ways to kind of rationalize and think through um, if I ever feel like I'm having a hard time and you know, a lot of times I'll get in my own mind and think that like, oh, this isn't warranted. Like I should be happier and like everything's okay. Like I live, you know, in a nice apartment and you know, I still have a job. You know, I've, I've worked from home for a long, long time, way before quarantine. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's, um, you know, it's not uh, acceptable for me to feel like I'm having issues with having a sense of connection with people. Because as you can probably tell, that is one of the things that is most important to me in all of life. Um, so for the past couple of minutes, I've been like talking at you guys the whole time. So I want to take a break from talking and I want to make this presentation a little bit more interactive. So to that end, we are going to break out into our Zoom rooms. Um, so basically, um, we had, um, or Laura Beth had sent out an article, um, uh, I think yesterday. Um, and if you haven't had the chance to read it just yet, that's okay. Um, but please. In the breakout rooms. Mm -hmm, we're exactly. The article in the chat for you to read and then discuss. Awesome. Thank you, LB. Um, so yeah, it was an article from UVA Today. This was the name of it. Um, Q, it was a Q&A with a researcher, and the name of it was How FOMO Has Changed Shape During Quarantine. Um, so as we break out into our rooms, um, I'm going to put some discussion questions up here on the screen. Thank you, LB, for dropping that in the chat. So please go ahead and open that. Take a couple of moments. Um, the article, it's not long at all. It's like maybe two pages if you take out the very large pictures that are in there. Um, so please take a moment to read that. Laura Beth will break us up into our um, individual Zoom rooms. And then um, there will also be some discussion questions on the slide. And then once we are finished discussing in the rooms, we'll get back together and I'll ask folks um, to have an opportunity. It will not be required, but you will have an opportunity to share some of what you discuss in your room. And one last thing before you, got it LB. Um, before you um, start talking, like, so once you read the article and before you start talking about the um, discussion questions, which I'll drop here in the chat in just a moment, um, I would like for you, just as like a little bit of an icebreaker, share with those in your Zoom room what is immediately behind your computer screen right now. So right now, behind my computer screen, I'm looking at more computer screens because I've got a lot of monitors on my desk. But um, whether it's like your dog or your feet because you're laying in bed or something like that, um, that's the icebreaker for today is please share what's behind your computer screen um, and LB if you could take it away. Thank you. That sounds good. Um, Catherine, if you want to um, send people to the rooms, that's great. We'll give everyone about seven minutes and um, then we'll come back together. If you get kicked out at any point or having trouble join, um, Catherine will be in the main room so she can help make sure you um, get in your breakout room. LB, Laura Beth, and the, the discussion groups, oh, there is the discussion questions. Never mind. Thank you. Yeah, so you'll be able to access the article and the discussion questions in the chat box. Alrighty, we'll see everyone in about seven to eight minutes.
So, um, all right, so this is uh, just kind of catching back up to the discussion questions. Um, thank you guys for being willing um, to share some of what you all talked about in the breakout rooms as well. So um, based on those, based on that feedback, I wanted to kind of give some quarantine strategies that I um, have not only like thought up myself, but I literally did like, not an official panel, but I did take like, like several small focus groups of friends, uh, friends and family who are like just us going through the same thing. And I kind of wanted to just put all in one place because um, when it comes to presentations like this, I don't like to just, you know, kind of say like, okay, well, this is what every, all the science says about how we're feeling, but not give any actual like, you know, actionable strategies on how to overcome these kinds of things. So here are some. Um, obviously video calls, things like FaceTime and um, Zoom. Um, I always encourage, um, especially a lot of my students to not just think of Zoom as something that you do for school. Um, you know, I know like that is probably like the main way that you use it, but I remembered when quarantine started, like I only ever use Zoom for work and I was like, oh, this is kind of weird. But over time, um, especially thanks to one of my friends who's on the call today, um, her name is Shri, she lives in Illinois and she actually started this like every Friday uh, virtual happy hour that we that we do ev literally every week now and I've noticed that I have like what I literally call every Friday I call it my zoom family and these are a collection of folks many of whom most of whom I have never met in my entire life but I'm like so engaged with their lives and what's going on and I want updates from them so um, like really thinking about how you can use technology to connect with people obviously is probably one of the most common ways that you'll hear of how to get through this um, one is like very fine tuned tip that um, I like to always share with people is that when you're on a call, like move and kind of react the same way that you would as if you were having that conversation in person. And so an example of this is that I've got like a dock, like a phone charging dock that's right here on my desk. And then also in my kitchen, I've got a similar dock that's just like kind of, it's an adhesive that's just like onto the counter and I can slide my phone into it kind of, it's very similar to like amount that you would put on like the vent in your car for your phone. And I just clip my phone in and that way when I'm in the kitchen, if I'm like cooking or I'm moving around, um, it just makes me feel that much more normal. It makes me feel like that friend might actually be like in my living room or in my kitchen chatting with me about whatever it is that we're talking about. Um, I think that even if you're on FaceTime, you know, instead of like just like laying down and being under the covers, like get up and move around. I feel like that definitely helps you kind of embrace the social connection that you're having. Um, there are all kinds of different apps, of course, things like WhatsApp, um, virtual game nights is one of uh, my personal favorites. Like I mentioned, LB and I have done that a couple of times with our friend group. Um, and this is like not an endorsement or anything, but one thing that I always really like to highlight is this game. Um, it's called We're Not Really Strangers. Just look them up on Instagram. You literally don't even have to buy it, although like it's like nice to physically have. Um, if you just go on like their Instagram, um, they post different cards every single Sunday. Um, and they're just like different discussion prompts that help try to facilitate connection. Um, and yeah, my friend Kaylin also just commented, she loves this game. And we actually get together, um, not every Sunday, but we try to get together every Sunday um, in order to go over some of the cards that they post on the Instagram. And it's just thoughtful prompts that give you an opportun opportunity to really connect with a friend. Um, so if you're missing your best friend, or even if they're not your best friend, even if it's a new friend, um, and just hit them up and be like, hey, want to like go through a couple of uh, We're Not Really Strangers cards? It's a good way to have really good, thoughtful conversation. Thanks, LB, for dropping that in the chat. Um, one of my good friends uh, who goes to UNC, I was asking her, I was like, you know, how do you like stay? Because like, obviously, like she literally was, was the one that told me she was like, I hate Zoom. I don't want to use it for fun. Uh, but I was like, so what do you guys do instead? Like, how do you connect with your friends? And one of the funniest things that she told me about were like these TikTok challenge, dance challenges where like they will like view or like the um, film themselves doing the TikTok challenge and then they will post it and then like everyone gets to vote basically on who did it best but you can't vote for yourself. Um, so I just thought that that was a really cool thoughtful way um, to kind of stay connected and do something fun and plus like I don't know if you guys have ever tried to film a dance on TikTok but it takes forever at least like maybe I'm a perfectionist and <laughs> it just takes me forever but it takes me a long time to get it just right. Um, and then another kind of example of that is quarantine art. Um, and I'll come back to that in just a second, actually. Um, another item, uh, like a virtual chop, that's actually one that me and my good group of friends uh, from college have actually been talking about doing. We haven't done it yet, but you guys know the TV show on the Food Network, Chop, where everyone gets like a mystery basket of ingredients and they have to just cook what they get. 
Yeah, that's exactly what you do. Everyone goes to the grocery store, gets the ingredients, and then I guess you can't really like judge it because there's no way to like, you know, give the food through the computer screen. Uh, but it's still something that's fun. And like, it also helps you try different recipes. And personally, like I mentioned the kitchen example earlier, I just, I love to cook. I love being in the kitchen. Um, a big and really, really important thing is to make sure that you're including others. Um, so one the reason that I put the dot, dot, dot here is because it is like, really easy to escape a Zoom call that you don't want to be a part of. Like, I don't mean to sound rude, but I'm just being honest. Like, if you end up on a Zoom call with like a group of friends that you're like, eh, this is whack, I don't want to be here. It's not like you have to like awkwardly like leave their house and be like, like make up some crazy excuse to go. It's just like, oh no, like my dog needs to go outside. I've used that like exactly once on a Zoom call that I was really like tired and um, over it. So um, yeah, definitely consider uh, including others, but keep in mind that like you can stretch yourself a little bit more in, in terms of including others, because if it doesn't go well, then you can leave the situation and that's okay. Um, and then lastly, just making sure that you check in often. Um, second piece, being okay with saying no. And third, making sure that you keep making memories. Because for me, that's been the best thing through quarantine. Like me and my best friend, his name's also Justin. We FaceTime literally every day. It's kind of embarrassing. I feel like we're like codependent at this point. But we have so many different inside jokes and different things that we've developed through quarantine that you wouldn't think, like he lives in Brooklyn, New York. Like we didn't even talk this frequently before quarantine. But the memories that we've been able to keep making has have been really, really meaningful. And so back to the quarantine art piece real quick, this is what I was talking about. So I don't know what this painting is supposed to be, but the top picture is like the actual painting. And then the bottom picture is this challenge where like a group of my friends, everyone gets together and you do a random like luck of the draw, everyone gets a piece of art and then they have to go in their house. They have 60 minutes, they have to recreate it. And then you have to like have someone take a picture of you recreating it. And again, you vote for who did it best, but you can't vote for yourself. So I just thought that, that was super fun and another way to kind of keep things exciting and connected with your friends during these quarantines. Um, so the end of today's presentation is gonna um, take a little bit of a shift. Um, I've been talking about how to you know, include people and making sure that you're staying connected with people, um, especially in times that are crazy with you know, the pandemic and the civil unrest. Um, and I always try to remind people of like a saying that I heard recently that showing up perfect is completely not necessary. And what I mean by this in terms of connecting with people is that you don't have to be on every single Zoom call. You don't have to see every single Instagram story. Like it is completely okay to not be perfect all the time. We're all going through a lot right now, but what's even more than showing up perfect is showing up at all, like showing up in any way, shape or form. Because keep in mind that like, you know, if you have a friend that's like reaching out to you and maybe you're not being responsive or vice versa, keep in mind that that friend would probably still really appreciate getting like 70% of you instead of just getting 0% of you and your energy and your presence. Um, and I always try to work, um, like a lot of the work I do is around decreasing the shame around people feeling like they have to be perfect all the time and to always say the right things because it's not like, I don't, I don't mean to get like too preachy about it, but I think that we live in a culture where people just kind of, you know, dig their heels in and they're like, oh my gosh, no, like I've already said this publicly. It's what I need to commit to. I can't change my opinion, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with learning more and then going back and changing your opinion. Once you've learned something that's different or, you know, not necessarily better, but just different. Um, so keep that in mind and that, you know, it reflects in how you communicate with people. And I think that showing up in any way, instead of always kind of being conscious about showing up perfect, definitely enables greater connection with us um, and everyone that we're interacting with. And on that same wavelength, um, I wanted to quickly tell you guys about this, one of the, the theories that I absolutely love. If you have been to one of my presentations before, or if you've ever even been like around me for more than two minutes, you've probably heard about it. The formal name of it is called the intergroup contact theory but the short name is called the contact hypothesis. And basically the way that it, um, what it says, it's like a sociological theory that says, if you are interacting with someone who has a different social identity than you, so like if you're a guy and you're interacting with a girl, or if you are, you know, like let's say you are cisgendered, but you're um, interacting with someone who's non-binary, like there are so many different ways to apply this, but it can be race, it can be gender identity, it can be sexual identity, it can be, um, so many different things, but it's basically just saying that if you're interacting with someone who might come from a different background or a different culture than you, then in the future, you're that much more likely to treat someone who is similarly situated more positively. So it's saying like, oh, like I'm Justin, I'm, you know, I identify as African American, I identify as male, and I identify as someone who uses a wheelchair, has a disability. 
But if I were to go out into the world and have a really positive, amazing interaction with someone um, who may be non-binary or um, and Caucasian and um, is able-bodied, then in the future, I will be so much more likely to have a positive experience with someone who is like them, even though they're different from me. Um, and when it comes back to meeting one new person every day, this science right here is so much a big part of why I do it. Because I realize that the more interactions that people have positively with me, hopefully as someone, for example, that has a disability, maybe they'll treat someone else in the future if they have a disability a lot better than they would have otherwise. And they'll be less, less phobic around that, um, that person with that social background. So that translates um, into um, being an ally. Like a lot of different times, a lot of conversations I have are all around all about how being an ally can be stressful or it can be hard and going back to the idea of showing up at all instead of showing up perfectly. Um, and a lot of the work I do around being an ally and allyship is all about the fact that people need to understand that it's okay to mess up from time to time. It's more about your intention and about making sure that you're attempting to be a good ally versus always getting it perfect. Um, and I always say it's like actually kind of recommended that you mess up sometimes because if you mess up, then you'll be able to learn from the mistake that you made. Um, you know, one area that I'm personally am constantly growing in um, is that as someone who identifies as a cisgender male, I often get my pronouns wrong. Um, and that's why I love that that's part of the etiquette rules here um, in Wellness Wednesday is to acknowledge those pronouns and to, you know, engage with those is specifically in a way that a person asks because that just shows so much respect for that person. And I know that and I get that and I honor that but it doesn't make it any less challenging for me to kind of shift my mindset if it's not what I'm expecting. So whenever someone corrects me, I don't get upset about it. I just say, thank you for correcting me. And I make sure that I improve myself as I move along. That's so, so important. I often encourage people when it comes to being an ally to help someone else think about or talk through that issue. Because if you're having a struggle with it, someone else might be too. And what you've learned can definitely help them learn. Making sure that you pay attention to your surroundings and your emotions is also really important in terms of a lot of times people, um, you know, marginalized populations can be overlooked and it's not anything with malice or misintention. It's all about the fact that someone just isn't familiar with it and they aren't thinking about it. I experience that with my disability all the time. Um, when it comes to just thinking about a location that's accessible or if I'm going out with friends, you know, pre-corona, if it's something, you know, we're going out to a restaurant, it's like, okay, like, did we consider whether or not there's an elevator, if there's a bunch of stairs? Um, so paying attention to your surroundings can go a really long way to helping someone feel more included and like you're being a good ally to them. And finally, I always recommend advocating for the visibility of someone that you care about. Um, th this is evident in the work that I do for myself, um, you know, through disability advocacy, but I don't only advocate for my disability. Um, I love doing work with folks who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, one of the biggest, you know, roles that I serve is as a chairman of a board for folks who are uh, blind and vision impaired. And although I do not identify with either of those um, disabilities, I think that their visibility is just as important as my visibility. So um, having that mindset of advocating for someone that you care about, whether they have a different social identity than you, um, or especially if they have a different social identity than you, is really valuable. Um, so real quick, um, I'll, I'll send these questions out because we're getting a little bit shorter on time, but these are just some prompts that I like to always share with folks in terms of helping, you know, think of, okay, if I'm, you know, interacting with someone and I want to be a good ally and I want to make them feel included, how exactly do I go about that? What do I say? These are some examples. Um, and like I said, I'll um, send these out. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes that definitely kind of, you know, wraps this today's presentation and today's talk all in one. It says diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. That's basically just saying that it's not just enough to have people who are different from you in your environment. It's about interacting with them and engaging with them. And that's where real inclusion happens. And that's what I think is most, most important. My second favorite quote is this one. Nobody, like if you go on the internet, some people say that Plato said this, but apparently that's not true. I learned recently. And it says, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. That is just compassion in a nutshell. You don't know what happened you know, to someone's day um, or to them in their day previously before they met you. So you know, if someone's you know, making you upset or bothering you, um, it's always important to be compassionate and think like, okay, they might've had a really hard day. What perspective can I bring to the situation to kind of help quell that conflict? So kind of in conclusion, if you remember one thing from today's presentation, um, literally, if you forget everything else that I said, this is what's most important. I think that all of our perspectives should lead with compassion and inclusion both together. Because if you're willing to be more compassionate and objective and engage with people, 
um, that automatically leads to inclusion. You're so much more likely to start a conversation with them and to be engaging with them. And I think that if we are more compassionate and more engaging, not only does that lead to inclusion, but it helps all of us feel more safe, it helps us feel more heard, and it makes us feel more part of the group. I think it's so important that we don't judge people. Um, it's natural to judge a book by its cover, it's definitely human nature, but it's also really important to give every single person an opportunity to say, okay, you might be going through the same thing that I'm going through, you just haven't communicated that to me yet. And when it comes to the pandemic and the social justice uprising and civil unrest in, in, in our country today, I think that when it comes to our personal wellness, being more patient with ourselves and being more patient with other people will always go a really, really long way. So I'm really sorry that I kind of rushed through that um, last part of the presentation. The technology issues threw me off a little bit. Um, it is literally 20 seconds to four. Um, so I don't know, Laura Beth, are we allowed to like go over time? Is that okay? <laughs> Um, so I would love to um, give you guys space for questions. Um, if you have them, Kareen is going to lead us in a closing um, mindfulness session. So we totally understand if you have to go. Um, I'm going to drop in the sign in link. Um, we always send out a recap email, so make sure uh, you fill that out because we can share Justin Graves' website, um, social media information. If you think of follow-up questions, if you have to jump right now, um, that you can reach out to him. Um, mm -hmm. Please reach out to me. I'm very easy to find. If you just go to the blog, more than happy to engage. So before we turn it over to Corrine, does anyone have any questions or comments for Justin? I just want to say that